broke out, we really weren't ready. We had 250,000 men in the National Guard and in the regular army. And President Wilson had wanted to keep us neutral, and being neutral meant we were not going to prepare, because we weren't getting into this thing. And in 1917, we got into this. And all of a sudden, logistically, it became a nightmare. How do you train what essentially is going to be 3 million men within six months? How are you going to build 16 camps? And how are you going to send everybody over there and give them the equipment that they needed? So as far as Upland came out, the rail from Yapank went right to New York City. So it was a natural location. There was a lot of land that was there. So they came out in June, and they took a look at the land, and they decided that they liked the land. There was only one problem. They said, that's, if the land is not that bad, there's some scrub pine that's around there. And before we build this, camp, we have to make sure that there's going to be 11,000 animals on this camp. There'll be mules, there'll be horses that you have to be able to build it in the stables in a certain area where that prevailing wind won't go over the camp. And I'll show you a little bit more with that. That's where Upton is located. It was named after a Civil War general. Uh, the 16 camps, 12 of them were named after Civil War generals. And there were 16 additional national camps that were regular army and national guard that were also named after Civil War generals. Yapank, it was close to the city. You got 20,000 acres of uninterrupted land, 16 square miles, and the railroad was right there. That's uh, the lake in the middle that you see is Lake Panamoka. The camp went from what's Montauk Highway, 27A, all the way to 25A. That's what they saw when they got there. This was the open road. If you ever go to Brookhaven Lab, that was the same road that you're going today to enter the camp. And you worked there? 35 years. So you know the road. You know the road well. Very well. Was the building 130, was that one of the last of the barracks? That's the one that they're thinking of, of use by saving. If you take a look, you say it's not going to be that difficult. But what they failed to take into account was that they had mined it for cordwood for years. And there were stumps everywhere. So at first glance, you look at it, you say, there's not that much brush. They predicted in June that we could have this camp up and running by September. And then they ran into the problems of mosquitoes. The work is that's Longwood Road also leading to the camp. That'll give you a condition of what these guys were fighting. Those are the tents of the workers. The first battle that they had were mosquitoes. Even though the pay was very good, double what they were paying farm kids on the East End. Matter of fact, the farmers on the East End, they were, they were worried because all their, all their employees were leaving the farm making twice as much money at the camp. Within the first two days, you look at that tent, the mosquito infestation <coughs> was horrible. By the second day of the camp, every worker walked off the job. They had a call in William Borges, who was famous for fighting with mosquitoes when they built the Panama Canal. He came in, they drained the swamps. The, the community there is known as Longwood. Before it was Longwood, it was called Long Swamp, appropriately named. They drained, they sprayed oil, and once they got it, that under control, work has started to come back. The wages, at that time, this was you know pretty good money, 37 cents, they're almost 38 cents an hour for unskilled labor. Uh, chauffeurs driving around making $4 a day. You take people making $60 a week to be a foreman. And at its lowest point, they had 5,000 workers. At its highest, they had 15,000. Have you ever been here work for the town? So I can insult them. Do you see how the town one works, six sit and watch? Well, can you imagine when you have 15,000 guys on a job site? What that was like? Two guys moving a tree, 13 or 14 sitting in a ditch watching the other two work. The camp was going to be designed like a horseshoe, and General Bell, who's going to be in charge of this camp, loved to have a hill in the middle from which he could view the whole camp. Here we bring horses, mules in. So this was going to be a mix of 20th century technology with 19th century technology. The railroad company came in and built all these spurs. Cars were coming in all, all night long. The people in the they, if you lived, if you lived near the tracks, you didn't sleep. These cars rumbled in 24 hours a day, bringing in supplies. And, excuse me. Tell me a question. 
Someone actually counted the amount of cars that came in. That's someone who has really too much time on their hands. Here they're bringing in coal, road gravel, lumber. This is a list of almost 3,000 railroad cars of lumber came into this camp. The only soldiers that they had available at that time was the 15th Colored Infantry in New York City, and they brought them out. So could you imagine when you had these immigrants coming into the camp to work, and they were being inspected at the gates by this 15th Infantry? And you'll see him going through the balloons. You know what he's looking for? Liquor. There was more inefficiency to building this camp due to liquor than anything. These guys were they had an undertaker that had to check his bottles. They pulled the corks off of them to make sure that it wasn't gin or something else. And at one time, uh, one of the soldiers was going through uh, the cases, and the guy said, you know, no African American will be going through any case of mine. And you can imagine where that elevated from there. So there, that was a big problem, but these were the only soldiers we had there. They kept order as much as they could. That's the ground that they dealt with. You take a look at it. You, you, you have to wonder, how are they going to finish this camp in two and a half months' time? This is, this is one of my favorite pictures. Actually, the other two slides, I put them in Saturday. I guess I did, it didn't save properly. I was going to ask if you thought it was the same one. But if you look at the left, you see the smoke right there? That's a train that's coming in. Once they clear, they put down tracks, almost five miles of movable track, so they could bring the lumber right to the, where the job site was for that day. You see the track right there? Yeah. Right at the bottom? They, they look more like mine L tracks than they do railroad tracks, don't they? I was always amazed with that. Slash and burn, anytime they got debris, the easiest thing to do was burn it right on the field. Here they are starting to lay out the infantry barracks. That would be looking east. And here's that mix of technology. We've got a train bringing in the road gravel, conveyor belt up into a horse and wagon, and to the left you see a mechanical tractor. Here they are steamrolling a road. Yeah, it, it's a little tough to see, but if you look carefully to the left of the barracks and to the right, you'll see all those stumps. Somebody's going to pull those out. They just have, you know, if they haven't been drafted, they will know sure. I love this picture also. You see, that's headquarters. The three buildings on the top are the division headquarters where all the officers will be meeting. The building on the right is General Bell's headquarters. Again, now you see the layout of the barracks. Trains drop off the lumber and other supplies. You know, it was pretty ingenious how they built these things. The they, they were divided into crews. The first crew had the job of building the, the decking, the floor. And if you look carefully, you see the siding that comes up? Those are the overhangs for the lower windows. Then they built the sides right flat on the deck. Assembly line homes. Building them. And then you push them up using a pulley system, pipes. That, that might, what was it, like 100, 150 men pushing that thing into place? Then you would nail them off. And you would go from job site to job site. So if you look at the far right, you can see they've already framed out the side over there. So these guys are just going from job to job. When the sides are up, when the roofers go on, when the plumbers come in, the electricians. And soldiers would talk how you could, you would go out for a march, and by the time you came back, there were eight new buildings in the camp. And there's my favorite train. You know, unfortunately, you don't see it so well, but you'll see a train. I like to think the train has dropped off its uh, load of lumber. It's on its way out. That's the hospital. I'm not sure anybody's going to get well there. <laughs> That's the trench digger. The trench, the only thing the trench digger did, it saved the work because they put in 18 wells. And a lot of the city soldiers, when they came out here, said they never knew that water tasted so good. At least back then, the water from Long Island was very delicious. 18 wells, sent to a pumping station, and then sent to, that's the inside of the pumping station, to 200,000 gallons worth of towers. 
Now, in their infinite wisdom, they built these sept some four septic tanks with, you see them in the back, those are the leaching fields. They didn't do a great job with the leaching fields, and they didn't do a great job in the kitchen traps. The grease filled up right away, and the grease went into the overflow, went into the leaching fields, and in the wintertime when the ground froze, and you put that grease on top, nothing penetrated, and the Army's solution was to just divert everything to the local river, which went through people's personal property, and you can imagine the stench. And then from there went into the Peconic River, and all the farmers who came and cut ice for their block houses in the winter time. And then in the in the spring, they you know the the cranberry bogs had to be flooded, and that sewage is what went into those bogs. Yeah, you, it, by the end of their time at the camp, they finally cleaned that one out. Just a picture. By the time they were done, there were 70 streets and roads inside that camp. Camp's getting built a bit more. This, this, I look at this picture and I always say to myself, what, did they have a plan when they were doing this? I mean, you know that they did, but if you look at it, it, it really looks like just, um, it's mass confusion. And you just wonder, what could they possibly be building here? You'll see the, see the track on the bottom left? I don't know how a train loaded with lumber did not tip something over how they weren't problems because that just doesn't look very sturdy. version. What was supposed to be 1,100 buildings actually became almost 1,600 buildings. And so it was now time to bring the soldiers in. That's Headquarters Hill. That's the cribbing done by the 302nd Engineers. That's the building that sits on Headquarters Hill today, the old reactor. And if you see right next, that's a water uh, tank at the top and also it's a tower. And that tower General Bell could climb up that tower and have a 360 view of all the training that was taking place. If there was something he didn't like, he'd send the message right down. Every soldier who went to Camp Upton always talked about how at nighttime you had to go up the hill. And from there, you know, if, you, if your mom or your girlfriend came to visit, this was the place you took people. And this was the 20th largest city in New York State at the time. General loved music, he loved singing, he wanted his men singing, he had his own band, it's great to the king. And so then the draft came. The camp wasn't ready, so they took them in quotas. We take 2,500 men on September 10. Maybe eight, 10 days later as more housing went up, we take more guys. And there were cheering crowds, people waving flags, girls kissing, everybody getting on the train. It was great to be a soldier. These guys were excited, this was gonna be an adventure of a lifetime. They got on the trains, <coughs> waited the by, and they would become known as the 77th Division. The full complement would be 40,000 men. They spoke 26 different languages. They had members of the police department. My grandfather trained during World War I at Camp Upton. His English was terrible at age 80. I can't even imagine what it was like when he was 20. But there was a fair amount that they wanted someone to do a job and you'd go, you know, no speaking lips. And that's why they set up a school very quickly, where if you didn't speak the language, they were going to teach you rapidly. They got off the train, and they were given orders. Columns of two. They had no idea what these non-commissioned officers were telling them. They had to line them up, bring them into the camp. This picture will say it all. You ever seen the movie The Gangs of New York? They really did exist. And in World War I, they made a truce that they would band together for the country and they'd fight the Germans. And this one guy put it from the gas house gang, imagine this, they're gonna give us medals for which they would electrocute us for in New York City. <laughs> and that's where if you ever saw the movie The Lost Battalion, the Germans referred to them as gangsters. Not that there were that many of them in the division, but that, got, that, that moniker got attached to them. I actually had a picture, and I, I just don't know what happened to the slide presentation. If General Bell had a publicist, today he'd be fired. If you look at that picture, when does a general ever stand downhill of enlisted men? And the general was a little shocked. They saw General Bell, good to see you, patting him on the back, 
He said, you have their long on enthusiasm, short on military discipline, but we'll teach them pretty soon. Here there were men they were lining up now being assigned in barracks. If they were assigned barracks, they were given an empty mattress. They were told to go out, get straw, load up your mattress as comfortably as you'd like it, right? And the requirement was that you had to open up your windows at least an hour a day, and it wasn't uncommon to see these straw mattresses hanging out the windows, trying to get, because if you imagine 200 guys sleeping on a floor in close proximity like that, that must have had some kind of smell to it. There's their first meal. Then you had to fill out a qualification card. This, and, and this was actually rather ingenious. You put out what your civilian uh, job was, and they wanted to see if there was a military application to that. So my grandfather, who was a tailor, if there were three tailors in his company, two of them would have been switched to another company. If there were five police officers, you would have spread that out so that every company had a variety of different occupations. This is, now you had your, your exam. If you passed your exam, you were in the army. <laughs> Temperature, eyes, teeth, nose, then you got all of your vaccinations. Iodine risk. The soldiers, when they, I guess one of the needles was like a horse needle they described it as, and they said that, you know, just see big guys, strapping guys, taking a look at that needle fainting dead away on the spot. And they derived great pleasure when future train loads of conscripts came in. They'd go down to greet them. They would tell them, wait till you see the needle. And, and that was a familiar chant. Now, this train load of guys just got there. And, you know, they don't, it doesn't look like much to do. There were no weapons there. They didn't have uniforms yet. So what do you do? Yeah, it's like the coach doesn't really know the sport. Push-ups, jumping jacks, sit-ups, squat thrusts, and you call it conditioning, getting, but there's no training. They took these poor guys out for marches, miles and miles of marches. I'm so impressed. Look at what these guys are dressed Shirt and tie. And they told them, you know, wear clothes that, you know, keep in mind that you may not have uniforms for a little bit. And it always impresses me. I, I look at depression era pictures where guys who are on food lines. You may have gotten all money, but you don't have all right shirts and ties at the doors, you know, waiting on a soup line. And the same thing here. And you look at these guys, and they're just so well dressed. And those marches of 14 miles a day will catch up with you inevitably. This is a picture of two days after they've been there. The first night they stayed, you know, everybody was just so excited to get there. And then that stark reality when the doors were closed and you were bunking with 200 other guys on your floor and there was, there, you could hear the sobbing of certain guys who kind of realized that they were in the army now. There were no, there, nobody was waving flags anymore. No one was blowing kisses. This was your new reality. Now photographers used to ruin the camp and they bought these group shots because that usually meant that they could sell 80 to 100 postcards on a shot like that. And when you didn't march, there was always stumps sending you out. They, oh, look at that guy in a shirt, tie, and jacket. Stumpy. And, you know, and that's all you hear soldiers. You know, my grandfather, he never talked much about World War I, at least not the part overseas. But he was happy. I remember you saying at the dinner table once, I told your father to go in the Navy in World War II. Too much marching in the Army. My father looked at me and said, you didn't tell me about seasickness or torpedoes. And, <laughs> I said, I'll tell you what, I thank the both of you. I think I'll just observe from here. I don't need to do this. But my grandfather, he was incessant about it. I, I don't want to even see trees, because that's all they did. And when the stumps were out, they'd make us go and reshuffle the dirt till it was nice and flat. The 302nd engineers were the first group that had a practical application of the skills they were going to need. They built much of the camp. You'll see how they cleaned out the one field on the bottom right, the marching, the soaring logs. Oh. Something else these guys weren't used to. Some of them, you know, you took a bath on April 1st and somewhere around June 15th, you took your second one. They were required to bathe every single night. And they usually took non-commissioned officers, lining them up, and making sure that they went through the shower to be clean each day. They said, we're not going to let one guy stink up a whole bag. 
outside shaving of bathhouses. They had a fire department that was set up. The camp was divided into three sections, 1,500 wooden buildings. You're asking for trouble, especially when that's your fire engine. That's one of the barracks that went up, and it gives you an idea of how fast this could become a problem. And the barracks were so close that you needed to get this under control. So not only did they have a fire department, but every company, if there was a fire in your area, you expected to break out and help fight that fire. 